Um, uh, my name is Debbie Doyle. I'm the meetings manager here at the American Historical Association. Thank you for joining us for Slavery in Space, Interdisciplinarity and International Perspectives, which is part of the AHA Colloquium series of Virtual AHA. We're excited to have you join us and are looking forward to a productive discussion. I would like to thank our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. You can support virtual AHA and other AHA activities by joining the AHA, or if you're already a member, making a donation today. We'll post links with details in the chat at the end of our conversation today. A few logistical things to cover before we start the webinar. By registering for or participating in the AHA's webinars, participants and panelists agree to abide by the AHA's code of professional conduct. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions to the presenters. We hope, we hope to address all relevant questions, but need to be mindful of the time, so we may paraphrase or combine questions. If you'd like to be a part, part of the conversation on social media, remember to use the virtual AHA hashtag, hashtag. Finally, a quick reminder that this webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording on the AHA YouTube, YouTube channel. I will now turn things over to Jared Hardesty from Western Washington University, who is the chair of today's session. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Debbie, and um, thank you to the AHA, um, and especially, uh, especially Victor Del, uh, Medina Del Toro for all of his work behind the scenes putting this together, making it happen. And thank uh, to all of you out there. This is a, a, a great turnout um, for wherever you might be, for whatever time zone you're in. Um, we're across the world right now, so which is kind of the neat thing about Zoom. Um, so uh, thank you all for attending this uh, virtual AHA session. Um, and as Debbie said, the title is Slavery in Space, Interdisciplinary and International Perspectives. Uh, my name is Jared Ross Hardesty. I'm an Associate Professor of History at Western Washington University in Bellingham, Washington. I'll be, uh, I'll be moderating what promises to be, in, in my humble opinion, of course, uh, an exciting conversation that examines the intersection of the history of slavery and spatial analysis through an interdisciplinary and international lens. Inherent to slavery is the necessity to control spaces and the mobility of and actions of enslaved people. Enslavers sought to limit and control people's movements and activities through, among other things, uh, systems of monitoring, enclosing, segregating, and patrolling. Enslaved, people, enslaved people's resistance to their bondage included their efforts to escape or modify these state, uh, spaces and expand their mobility and, activity, uh, and activities within them. In doing so, enslaved people developed alternative ways of knowing and navigating these spaces. Spatial analysis can be used to better understand how enslavers use space to control enslaved men and women, and it can reveal how enslaved people resisted in these spaces. Moreover, spatial analysis has proven an especially useful method uh, to reconstruct the histories of those people uh, whose voices are oftentimes difficult to find in the archives. Their stories can emerge from an analysis of the spaces they inhabited. Over the past two decades, spatial analysis has made a significant impact in various disciplines that research uh, slavery in the lives of the enslaved. Developments in digital cartography and the digital humanities more broadly uh, have encouraged research that looks at slavery from a spatial perspective. The fields of archaeology, architectural history, urban history, and women and gender studies have played a similarly important role in advancing spatial analysis as a way to obtain new insights into the history of slavery in the Americas. This roundtable brings together scholars from various fields, slavery studies, history, archaeology, architectural history, public history, and urban history, uh, who use different considerations of space in their research. In short, we hope to use this session as an opportunity to begin a conversation on spatial analysis and slavery, and very much look forward to your participation in that conversation. Each panelist will speak for five to 10 minutes, uh, and then we'll open up the conversation for everyone here. Uh, before introducing the panelists today, I'd like to remind everyone if they'd like to submit a question, as, as Debbie mentioned in the beginning, to use the Q&A function, and I'll be moderating that along with the, the folks at the AHA. Since this panel is interdisciplinary and international in scope, uh, please provide your name and affiliation when asking a question so we kind of know where it's coming from. Now for our speakers. I'll introduce them in the order in which they are presenting. Dr. Uh, Guadalupe Garcia is an associate professor of history at Tulane University and specializes in the history of cities and colonialism in Latin America and the Caribbean. Her research examines the intersection of colonialism, empire, and urban space 
and focuses on free black or free black and enslaved peoples in Havana, Cuba. Uh, Dr. Garcia is currently working on a book project that explores the use of digital humanities as a counter to the logic of the colonial archive. Dr. James A. Dell is a historical archaeologist who currently serves as graduate dean at Millersville University in Pennsylvania. He holds a BA in history from Holy Cross, an MA in historical archaeology from the College of William and Mary, and a PhD from the University of Massachusetts. His research focuses on the spatial dynamics of Jamaican slavery. Dr. Aaron Holmes is the Kinder Institute Postdoctoral Fellow in History at the University of Missouri. She's a social historian of architecture, material culture, and slavery, and is currently working on a manuscript project entitled The House That Slavery Built, Social and Material Transformation of the British Atlantic World, 1670 to 1831. Before arriving at the Kinder Institute, Dr. Holmes was the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation Postdoctoral Curatorial Fellow, that's a mouthful, at the American Antiquarian Society, or the American Philosophical Society in, uh, Museum in Philadelphia, uh, where she was the lead curator for uh, the project Mapping a Nation, Shaping the Early American Republic. Dr. Andrea Mosterman is Associate Professor in Atlantic History and the Joseph Triegel Professor in Early American History at the University of New Orleans. Her forthcoming book, Spaces of Enslavement, A History of Slavery and Resistance in Dutch New York, is coming out this fall with Cornell University Press. And finally, uh, joining us from Amsterdam is Dr. Uh, Dinka Hondius, uh, Assistant Professor of History at the, um, I'll just uh, anglicize this, the Free University of Amsterdam, uh, a staff member of the Anne Frank House, uh, its Department of International Educational Projects, and Ida E. King, Distinguished Visitor, Visiting Professor of Holocaust Studies at Stockton University in Galloway, New Jersey. Among her research projects are Mapping Slavery, uh, which focuses focus on the digital uh, mapping of relevant locations for the history of slavery and the slave trade in the Dutch Empire, and Mapping Hiding Places, focused on mapping locations of hiding places used by Jews during the Holocaust across Europe. So without further ado, uh, please welcome our panelists and uh, especially Dr. Garcia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jared. And I wanna thank Victor and the HA for making this panel possible. As Jared said, my work on Colonial Havana is concerned with producing a history of the city that takes seriously both the colonial and racial geographies operating in Havana while also engaging the city that slavery and slave mobility produced. This is a task this task is both a research endeavor as well as a methodological exercise. While documenting enslaved demographics and material environment and the interplay between the two is a necessary first step of my research, the challenge lies in envisioning a space outside of the logic of colonial administrators. For Havana, this means envisioning the city beyond its Spanish functions, a city not just oriented to the Atlantic, but rather to the rivers, streams, forests, swamps, and peripheral parcels of land that allowed free and enslaved residents of the city to navigate colonial rule. To illustrate the challenges of this work, I'd like to begin this roundtable by briefly introducing two narrative accounts of Havana's physical environment that provide an opportunity to think through the tensions of the archive and its sources. The first is an account of the city by Brigadier General William H. Ludlow, who in 1899, in his role as newly appointed governor of Havana under the U.S. occupation, compiled the annual report informing U.S. Congress of the city's condition. In that document, Ludlow describes Havana as a place devastated by war. It was also a city filled with primarily, quote, women and children. His wonder at the presence of unaccompanied women, many of these impoverished Black migrants from the surrounding areas, contrasts markedly with government impressions of the Cuban countryside. There, administrators noted that the continued presence of Black women laboring in the fields was a welcome continuity from slavery under Spanish colonial rule. The demographics of Havana had undoubtedly changed consider considerably in the immediate aftermath of war. The city's transformation, however, could not erase the impact of slavery as a dominant force shaping the city's urban space. From 1790 through the first decades of the 19th century, upwards of 215,000 enslaved people and likely as high as 300,000 were brought to the island through Havana's port. During this same time period, the city's population grew fivefold from roughly 50,000 to over 200,000 people. Enslaved and free people of color followed similar patterns of growth with the greatest increase occurring in the enslaved and free population of Havana. The laws governing Cuban slavery required that slaves 
be brought through Havana before continuing inland. And this created a steady stream of enslaved people to fill the city's industries. It was primarily women and oftentimes very young women who were made to labor as domestics, nannies, and in other gender specific trades. While urban slavery coincided with exponential urban growth in the intramural or walled city of Havana, outside of the city walls, neighborhoods of free, enslaved, and formerly enslaved families also composed part of the urban fabric. The neighborhoods of Jesus del Monte and Cerro to the south of the city, for example, were governed as separate entities from Havana even after the 1807 unification of the city. And the unification of the city is also what's accounting for that exponential urban growth. These neighborhoods house smaller agricultural communities and would have been well known to enslaved residents who forged community and whose work allowed them to look outside of the walled city. Given the presence and circulation of enslaved men and women, how then do we make sense of Ludlow's remarks at the end of the 19th century when the demographic numbers for enslaved and free people of color marked the highest rate of growth in Havana? I argue that it was not just the presence of women and girls that Ludlow was remarking upon, upon, but rather the visibility and mobility of young, black, and newly free women in the urban landscape. Now, I'd like to contrast this example with another significantly different archival moment. This time, my example is called from a fugitive slave ad published in an, eight, in an 1829 publication of the Diario de La Habana, the official paper of Spanish colonial news. The ad, which would have circulated among residents in both the intramural and the extramural districts of the city, offered a reward for news of the whereabouts of a young enslaved girl called Margarita. The ad described her as una negrita conga, or a recently arrived young black girl, approximately 14 years, 14 years old and very dark in skin color. The newspaper also printed a description of her clothes, noti noting that she fled wearing a blue checkerboard tunic and a white headscarf. In contrast to the women and children that Ludlow described, Margarita's departure from the intramural part of the city was deliberate. Hers was a purposeful disappearance from the colonial landscape. She emerges in the colonial record and thus in the Spanish colonial archive only after her calculated move to flee the city. The record of her departure and lack of information of her whereabouts begs us to rethink the relationship between black mobility and urban space. The fact that the fugitive slave ad was placed in the newspaper with circulation outside of the walled city also suggests a widespread knowledge of its different geographies and enslaved ways of negotiating these. Both of the examples narrate the city and its residents through an imperial and archival gaze. I am most interested in illuminating a history of Havana unbounded by the constraints of space, naturalized by the history of Spanish colonial rule and envisioned on a colonial map. Instead, I am proposing that we approach the colonial city as a text and archive through which free and enslaved ind individuals constituted multiple geographies. This means framing the city away from the Atlantic and taking seriously an environment that makes more sense to everyday forms of movement within a system of slavery and surveillance. For example, in Havana, this would have meant that Margarita would have been choosing from pre pre-designated paths to flee the city. She almost certainly would not have headed east or west since this would have meant that she would have had to negotiate private farms with security or else the public plazas that in the early dawn hours would have made her more visible to colonial administrators. Her map of the city would have looked significantly different than the space organized by the plazas, cathedrals, and marketplaces important to colonial administrators. It also means that as we locate within a colonial, colonial geography, the traces and material echoes of lives such as Margarita's, our first and necessary step is in reorienting our spatial understanding of the city. We know, for example, that, colonial gov that the colonial government controlled urban space through colonialism and slavery. We see this first and foremost through the construction of Havana's built environment. But how is it, how is it that we can think outside of that to narrate geographies of enslavement alongside of enslaved mobility? This would be to acknowledge the multiple ways in which urban space is constituted through the series of relationships and their interplay in the material environment, rather than reducing that space to city space and specifically a city space that belongs to the colonial administration. As we know, Havana was built to facilitate colonial and imperial relationships. And while cities weren't built for enslaved people, they were built by enslaved people, both literally and figuratively. And given the sheer number of enslaved residents who resided within them and for whom race was woven into the very fabric of everyday urban life. Thank you.
Okay, I'll, I'll just go ahead then, uh, Jared, I'll start. Thanks. Uh, my name is James Dell. You can call me Jim. I am, uh, as Jared mentioned, the Dean of Graduate Studies at Millersville University, and I'm an historical archaeologist. I've been working on the question of spatial dynamics on Jamaican slavery now for 25 years or so in a variety of contexts. And what I'd like to share with you today are some of my reflections on that work and uh, what I've come to learn uh, anyway about the enslaved experience in Jamaica. Uh, in preface to that, I think we have to recognize, and I suspect everyone in this virtual room does, that the experiences of slavery uh, were very diverse. Um, and in order for us to study a case example like I do, we have to understand the context in which we are studying that case. So temporally, there are going to be differences. The enslaved experience in, 17, in 1670 is very different from the enslaved experience in 1810. Geographically, the experience in say Bahia is gonna be very different than what we would see in New York. And functionally, uh, depending on the commodities being produced uh, in what volume and um, at what, what, what seasonality, there's all kinds of questions about what's happening in the um, interpersonal and functional landscapes depending on what particular crop is being grown, grown on plantations. And I'm focusing primarily on plantation slavery. So the intersectionality of these various socioeconomic factors resulted in the development of really a wide range of spatial forms, um, which in turn function to shape individual behaviors and interpersonal relationships on and between plantations. Of course, overlaying on this is the, the structure of enslavement. I don't want us to forget that. But within slavery, again, we have these multiple different kinds of spatial and, and social experiences um, throughout the, the Atlantic world. Uh, in the context that I'm studying, which is Jamaica post-1790, uh, we have several events that happened that influenced the design of plantations and the lived experience on those plantations. One of those is the uprising in Haiti in 1790. Uh, and another, of course, is the uh, abolition of the legal slave trade in 1807. Both of those events had profound um, impacts on the way that plantations were constructed and designed and the labor regimes on those plantations and the relationships between the enslaved and, um, and the enslavers and amongst the enslaved themselves. So the plantation space that I'm looking at in coffee plantations in Jamaica was modeled simultaneously on the existing sugar plantation antecedents on the island, which had been there for 200 years almost by the time uh, we have uh, coffee plantations starting up at the end of the 18th century. And they're also, this design is also influenced by uh, Saint-Domingue uh, emigres, planters who are fleeing the revolution in Haiti. They're welcomed in Jamaica um, to help jumpstart really a new economy. Um, the, the markets in Europe were dependent upon Saint-Domingue coffee at that time. Uh, there was a market vacuum that was created uh, with uh, the drop in production during the revolution in Haiti. And uh, the Jamaicans sought to very quickly fill that gap. Um, by quickly, you know, have that, that's also a contextualized term because it takes at least five years for coffee trees to bear once you start a plantation. So there was a, there was a lag. Um, uh, but uh, the interesting thing about Jamaica and the, the initial placement of these uh, plantations was that they were placed in upland uh, forests, which at that time would have been perceived as wild wilderness and dangerous places by the white planter class. These were areas that were dominated for centuries by maroon communities. Uh, these are places where even uh, those who would escape slavery but not join the maroons would establish uh, small communities out in the wilderness. These were places where uh, folks did not, the white folks did not necessarily freely go. They were afraid of those spaces and they avoided them largely. Uh, but nevertheless, they were perfect areas for growing coffee. Uh, and what we see happening in the late, 17th, late 18th, early 19th century is that some of the upland valleys, especially on the south uh, slope of the Blue Mountains, are being exploited for coffee plantations. Uh, old growth forests are being quickly uh, not, you know, cleared. Coffee plantations are being thrown up very quickly. And uh, at that moment, there is a, a primacy on surveillance. We have instances where uh, large labor gangs of one or 200 are being moved into these plantations with a white population of three or four um, living on those plantations. So even as late as the 18 teens, 1820s, you have a disparity uh, in the demographics of about 90% enslaved people, 10% uh, whites, and, you know, um, mostly plantation staff. So this, this, uh, this uh, underlying fear this need for control of space and of population 
created a landscape in which the surveillance was built into the layout of plantations so that overseers' houses were um, placed intentionally uh, to be able to surveil what was going on in the plantation villages, which at that point was where you would see the most locus or the most intense um, activity going on amongst the enslaved population. And there was a primacy put on inter plantation communication. So one thing that I was able to do in one of the valleys I studied in the Blue Mountains is a view shed analysis using GIS. And it was quite clear that the overseers houses and those um, great houses, the planters houses that actually were built, were built such that there was, they were built in view of each other up and down a valley so that they were in constant, the whites, if they wanted to be at least during the day, could be in visual contact up and down this valley between plantations. Now, uh, by 1815, uh, which is when another plantation that I've been studying really begins to, to flourish, uh, we're entering into a second phase of uh, Jamaican planting of, of coffee. Uh, the first big boom is over. The, uh, there was a, uh, an overproduction crisis that, that drove a lot of people out of uh, business when the, um, the markets were closed to British imports. Uh, the, the continental market scan, which was where most of the Jamaican coffee was going. Uh, there was a crash in prices. Many people who invested in coffee plantations went bankrupt. The plantations themselves were being um, consolidated by those who had the means to do so. So we have an era where we have a consolidation of production, a second boom following the defeat of Napoleon, and uh, we have a different spatial logic unfolding on these estates. Um, and one of the things that I'd like to do now, I'm going to share my screen with you to show you two maps of one plantation. This is a plantation called Marshall's Pen. It's located on the Manchester Plateau in central Jamaica. And, you know, we archaeologists love to look at maps because it helps us locate things like uh, what is uh, on this map defined as Negro houses. Here's the initial village of Marshall's Pen. And it's very easy to take a, take a look at a map like this and see that we have a blank landscape. We have uh, the enslaved village. We have the works uh, of the estate where the white population is moving. And it's very easy to understand the space uh, there as being uh, you know, racially divided. Um, but if I were to look at another map that I discovered of the same estate, we get a, a different story, which I think helps reveal a little bit more about the complexity of what the spatial life was like. You'll see there's the villages are not located here on this particular map. This is was uh, part of a lawsuit over the boundaries of the borders of this estate. And as a result of that, some of the contested area between two landowners was more was, was drawn in a little bit more detail. And when we start looking at this, and this uh, really kind of shocked me when I started looking at this at first, you start to see things here like uh, this little feature, a hut here a hut here, a hut here, the defendant's house, which is an abandoned house there, huts here. So suddenly what we're seeing is a landscape that's not divided spatially between the village and the estate, um, but rather one in which uh, we have an overlay of enslaved spatial movement across the estate. So again, the, the village itself would have been here, and yet we have residences spread out at least throughout this area of the plantation. Uh, more likely, we had similar kinds of uh, structures all throughout the estate. And as an archaeologist, one of the things that we like to do, of course, is go and field test some of these things. And in fact, I did some excavation based on this particular locator map and found a, a number of these places were actually there. This is not just a, some you know, um, convention that was written on a map, but actually what we did see was uh, a landscape where we had an interspersed um, residence. Um, so rather than imagining these plantations as being totally segregated and, and focused on control, at least by the 1815s, uh, 18-teens, 1820s, we start to see a much more complex landscape uh, in which the uh, movement across the landscape is probably more dominated by the enslaved than we would uh, initially imagine, where the lives of the planters are being more constrained um, as uh, this, this landscape unfolds um, during this time period. So those are some of the key points of my research that I've been uh, exploring, and I'm very happy to have had the chance to at least briefly explain some of it to you here today. So thank you very much. Okay. Uh, 
Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking the AHA and particularly Victor for his technical support um, for hosting this roundtable and using its platform to ensure that despite the circumstances, the important conversations that happen at the annual meeting of the American Historical Association each year have a space, albeit a virtual one, um, in which to continue. And I'd also like to thank my fellow panelists for their insights into a subject that I've found intriguing since I first became a historian. Those of you who've made time to join us virtually and especially Jared and Andrea for their hard work in organizing this panel, especially since I know that pulling a panel together can be hurting, like hurting cats, um, and I am definitely a hard cat to herd. Um, in my comments today, I wish to fo focus on four critical points, at least one of which I feel, I feel certain will be reiterated by most of us. Um, first, and likely the common thread through much of our discussion, is the importance of interdisciplinarity to study of space, particularly in relation to the study of slavery and enslaved people. Second, how the spatial turn allows us to reclaim spaces that have been ceded, I would say wrongly, to narratives about white elites. Third, the need for scholars of spatiality to consider questions of inter about interior spaces and materiality more fully. Finally, the importance of discussions about spatiality to the narratives around slavery presented at public history sites and the opportunities to redefine the public's understanding of slavery and the experience of experiences of enslaved people through considerations not only of space in the past, but in the present. The first and perhaps the most significant thread throughout this discussion is inherent, but often not fully realized, potential for interdisciplinarity in the study of space, which I know is a key theme in bringing this panel together. In recent, I've heard two prominent historians, who I won't name, suggest that true interdisciplinarity is impossible, or more colorfully, and I'm tweaking the language used here, that, quote, doing interdisciplinary work just means being dumped on from both sides. Um, you can infer on your own how I tweak that comment. Um, what these comments ignore has been, in my opinion, a failing of some historians pursuing spatial histories in particular, is the need to fully engage with other disciplines critical to our work, a process that, from my perspective, demands a more thorough introduction to and engagement with dis different disciplines and methods at the undergraduate level. In my own work on the way physical spaces shape the experiences of enslaved people and ideas about slavery and colonial identity, I had the opportunity early on to see the value and need for real training and engagement, not only in the field of history, but in architectural history, archeology span and material culture. And the further I've progressed, the more I've come to understand how both how unusual this is and how challenging it can be for students um, who can be siloed off into increasingly narrow specialities. I was fortunate as an undergraduate to have the model of Dr. James Wittenberg at Wynn Mary, who has served as a bridge and translator between historians, archaeologists, architectural historians, scholars of material culture, geographers, and many others, and to have been encouraged by him to find the best person to answer whatever questions I might have and to follow those answers to new questions, even when it meant detouring to spend time in archaeological field schools or documenting historic pictures, rather than adhering to conventional wisdom and conventional sources. Over time, I've come to think of these different tools as different tools or vocabularies, and it's shocking how many re rely on being conversational in a methodology or discipline when fluency is required, to be drawn on when needed rather than immovable disciplinary boundaries. The second point I wish to raise as part of our discussion is the re racing of boundaries that have so long defined space, the spaces of slavery in particular. A key work in, architectural, in the architectural history of slavery, John Michael Blatch's seminal 1993 work, Back of the Big House, The Architecture of Plantation Slavery, begins explicitly at the back door of the plantation, of the plantation Great House and moves outward, drawing much needed attention to slave quarters, overseers' houses, barns, dairies, etc., which had long been neglected by traditional architectural history. Blatch pushed vernacular architectural history consider, to consider these spaces as part of the history of so-called ordinary buildings, as part of its rebellion against studying high, the high style and monumental work that architectural historians had focused on up to that point. More recently, Joby Hill's Saving Slave Houses project, documenting extant structures, and Joseph McGill's Slave Dwelling project have given even greater dimension and meaning to the importance of documenting and preserving these structures. <clears throat> 
But in Blatch's model, architectural historians and many others have continually ceded the spaces of the plantation house and public buildings to those now long dead historians of high style who primarily focused on white elites, discussing enslaved people primarily as builders rather than occupants whose labor and living shape the use in those spaces. By reclaiming these spaces and not just talking about enslaved domestic laborers in the liminal spaces of the house or in dedicated service spaces like basements and pantries, it becomes harder to ignore the critical role that slavery played in shaping all aspects of daily life and culture and more broadly political ideology. From my own research and perspective, the comparative nature of these erased boundaries is also particularly important. Um, in my own work, I focus on right now Barbados and South Carolina, but have long studied Virginia as well. And by looking at these landscapes in a comparative perspective, things that would not have immediately um, appeared significant become more clearly defined as distinct features. Building on this, my third point is the need for greater focus on the interior spaces and materiality of the spaces of slavery. By seeking macro narratives of space and slavery, we reinforce that the lived experience is unknowable and we can speak only in trends and generalities, while a focus on the materiality and physicality of space reminds us and allows us to engage with the individual experiences of slavery, even when the documentary record is silent. One point that I raise when I give tours of historic buildings is the need to consider how easily enslaved people could move through spaces, what they could see or hear, and where they could be seen or heard, and how these things shaped their negotiation of the spaces of slavery. This segues neatly into my final point about the discussions about spatiality to the narratives around slavery presented at public history sites and the opportunities to redefine the public's understanding of slavery and the experiences of enslaved people through con considerations not only of space in the past, but in the present. By presenting narratives that provide a tangible sensory and individual connection to the past, the, connect uh, the connection of that past to the present becomes clear. For members of the public, visits to sites of slavery really always begin with tours of the plantation house before visiting the slave quarters. And by simply inverting this order, as can be seen today at Whitney Plantation in Louisiana, by making it uh, by making it impossible to avoid confronting slavery rather than an optional extra, it becomes clear that the reality for most was not the luxury of the plantation house, but the brutality of slavery, and that within all of those spaces, enslaved people were able to carve out their own spaces and push against the white supremacist ideas that defined many of the physical boundaries of their world. Um, so thank you for your time. I know I spoke really broadly, um, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of our discussion. Awesome. I think it's my turn. Um, well, I'd also like to thank, uh, of course, AHA and Victor, uh, Jared for moderating and all of you for joining us today. Uh, I really hope that we can generate some discussion after, um, after our presentation. So I'll try to keep this brief and I want to just share my screen. Um, let me see if this works. Okay. There you go. Everybody can see this, right? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so when thinking about slavery and in my work, I really look at um, the, um, my research on slavery in New York that, um, that is coming out in the fall in, in um, this book called Spaces of Enslavement. Uh, what I did in that work was looking at the ways in which spatial analysis can help us uh, give a different insight into the experience of, of slavery, uh, the experiences of enslaved people in this area. Now, there's a lot of different things that, um, that are important to look at, as many of my fellow panelists have discussed, like architecture, um, archaeology, and such. And what I want to look at today, though, is just briefly talk about the meanings of spaces, because I think that that is another important um, element and an important part of spatial analysis, where we really consider what do spaces mean to people and what influences um, those meanings and, and how might they change over time or how might they be different for different people in those spaces. In my research on New York, I found this especially important um, or useful to, to do so because so oftentimes, so often when talking about slavery in New York, the narrative that dominates is that 
uh, in, in New York, enslaved and free people lived in the same homes, uh, navigated the same streets, they worshiped in the same churches. And while that might be true, of course, their experiences in those spaces were inherently different. Enslaved men and women uh, often slept and worked below, behind, or above the home's main living quarters. Their activities in the streets were closely monitored and regulated, and their participation in churches was oftentimes prohibited. When it was accepted, it was limited and uh, segregated. So enslaved and free New Yorkers experienced the spaces in which they interacted very differently. Uh, several scholars have talked about this. Some of the people that have influenced some of my thinking on this are um, Elizabeth Maddock Dillon and Ann Stoller and their work and kind of thinking about how people might experience spaces differently at different times or how different people might experience those spaces and even their interactions within them very differently depending on who they are and what their circumstances are. Now when investigating Dutch American homes in early New York then it becomes apparent that enslaved and free inhabitants experience those spaces very different and let me just show you a few images of that. So here you see uh, Schuyler Mansion uh, on the left, there's a model of Schuyler Mansion, and on the right, you uh, there's a picture of the back of the house. This was, uh, of course, the house of the uh, the Schuyler family in what today is Albany, New York. And uh, it's a beautiful house for anybody who has visited. Um, large hallway, large living spaces, high ceilings, lots of windows. But um, the enslaved people, of course, very rarely uh, would have uh, entered those spaces. They instead lived in the basement of the home. And um, that basement had an access point on the back of the house. That's where the stairwell down to the basement would have been. And they would have entered, um, when leaving that basement, they would have entered this walled work area that you can see on the model here. I don't know if I can, so this area. So the home was not only experienced very differently because of the, um, the part of the home in which they lived, they were also severely limited in their uh, movements within that space and actually surveilled from the windows in the back that there was this um, system of monitoring that could actually watch them and make sure that their movement within these spaces was severe, severely limited um, and contained. Here is another space of enslavement um, in early New York, and this is in what today is in Brooklyn, New York. This is the Lot House. And uh, you can see here on the left a picture that I took a while ago uh, of the house. This was the original living uh, space. It was built in the early 18th century. This was the sleeping area above here of the Lot family. They added this lean-to, which was a kitchen. And then under the eaves here was the area where the enslaved people um, were, uh, were living. Uh, there's a picture here of a small stairwell that went up to that area. And then you can see here on the right, a picture of the, uh, the garret space where uh, many of them lived. And in both cases, Schuyler Mansion and the Lot House, uh, it was about, 10 to 12 people in the 1790s who were enslaved by these families and would have lived in these spaces. So it shows how even though they lived in the same home or homes as, as their enslavers, we can clearly see how their experiences would have been very different, right? Um, in Schuyler Mansion, um, uh, in the basement, which was very common, uh, but also very much a controlled environment. And in fact, in the lot house, they found that there were locks on the outside of the doors to these garret spaces, which suggests that they may even have been locked in those spaces temporarily to, to limit their movement. So when we think about this, it's important to, uh, when we think about these spaces and we look at that, it is important to, to uh, think about this beyond this, the physical aspect of these spaces. And um, here I want to just briefly refer to Catherine McKittrick's work. Uh, she discusses Harriet Jacobs's uh, years in the guest space, where she um, where she hid from her um, enslaver. Now, even though Harriet Jacobs discuss, uh, discussed that garret space as, um, and I'm quoting her now, the continued darkness was oppressive. It seemed horrible to sit or lie in a cramped position day after day without one gleam of light. She also said about that space, yet I, have, I would have chosen this 
rather than my lot as a slave. In fact, she called the garret space a loophole of retreat and McKittrick refers to it as a, a retreat to emancipation. And so it's, it's the experience within these spaces that is so important to consider here, that it's not just the physicality of it, it's also what those sp spaces meant to the people who lived in them. And when we think about the home, oftentimes we think about homes as symbols of family, domesticity, and, and a safe haven, right? But for enslaved people, that was uh, absolutely not the case. Uh, and we can see that throughout the records, how these homes would have had very different meanings for enslaved people. Just the, the, the abundance of uh, runaway save advertisements that show that so many enslaved people actually tried to get away from these spaces. Um, those advertisements also detail the, um, the Okay, I think we seem to have lost Andrea from. Um, oh, there she is. Yeah. We lost you for a minute, is there, Andrea. Oh, can you hear me yeah. now? I'm so sorry. Yes, you're back. <laughs> yes. Okay. How much did you? How much? How how long was I gone? <laughs> uh, about fifteen twenty seconds. Okay. Good. Okay, so um, so I was talking about the. I'm so sorry, y'all. This always happens, of course, when it's not supposed to happen. Um, of, of course, it's never supposed to happen. <laughs> but, um, so I was talking about the, the runaway save advertisements and how they show that these were that these were spaces that enslaved people tried to get away from, um, but that those runaway save advertisements also detail the um, the abuse and the neglect that enslaved people faced in these spaces. The the scars that are detailed uh, that are clearly uh, scars from from abuse from whippings in some cases, the uh, frozen toes that are oftentimes detailed, which are evidence of, of the lack of proper shoe wear that so many unsafe people in New York um, had for the, the cold winters that they were living through. So this shows, um, you know, how their experiences were different. And that said, it was not a safe space uh, for these unsafe people. It also, um, these advertisements also detail how a lot of people were trying to get away from these spaces in search of family, right? And so when we think about the home as a, a, a space that symbolizes, fam symbolizes family, in the case of New York, a lot of unsafe people would not have been living with their family members. They would have been living um, in, in the homes of different enslavers, sometimes in different towns or sometimes even in different counties. And, um, and, and so for many of these people to be with family meant to actually leave this space. For those people who were living in these homes with their family, there was always the threat that they would be separated. And uh, I mean, there's, there's numerous bills of sale, wills that detail this, um, children as, as young as one year old that are threatened to, to be separated from their parents, from their siblings. And, um, and this is another important part of, of how that would have influenced the way that people experience these spaces. And Sojourner Truth has some very poignant discussions of that, how that affected her and how that affected her parents. Now, um, so when we really think about what these spaces meant, we can see that they were inherently different in meaning for the people who, who lived in these spaces, who were um, held in bondage in these spaces. For them, these were spaces of of enslavement, these were spaces of abuse, neglect, family separation, forced labor. Now, importantly, um, we do see that enslaved people are responding to this, right? And are always trying to create some sense of family and community within those spaces uh, to, to create them, uh, to create safe spaces within them. And you can see that here from evidence that was discovered at the lot house, which that at the Garrett space that I just showed you, they discovered some of these um, uh, corn cobs, uh, a cloth pouch that contained an oyster shell and a goat pelvis. And these were placed very strategically by the entrance and by the chimney, which very likely was uh, intended to safeguard this space, that that was why they were placed there. So uh, we see these different ways um, that enslaved people are, are, are trying to create these, these uh, safe spaces and try to make these spaces of, of family, but obviously there were significant challenges in doing so. So 
when when thinking about this, um, I suspect that for most enslaved New Yorkers, they would have experienced these homes in in in. Uh, very similar to what Frederick Douglass here describes about the uh, the structure that he lived in in Maryland, uh, which he described as charmless. It was not home to me. On parting from it, I could not feel that I was leaving anything which I could have enjoyed by staying. I looked for home elsewhere and was confident of finding none which I could relish less than the one I was leaving. So I'm going to leave it at that, um, but I'd love to continue the conversation in a little bit. Thank you all. Thank you, Andrea and uh, Dr. Hundis, you're up. Thank you very much. I also want to thank uh, the organization and uh, especially uh, uh, Jared and especially Andrea. Uh, we are both from the Netherlands and uh, uh, it's uh, so uh, great to, to see you and to be invited for this panel. I will quickly share my screen for a brief presentation. Um, to yeah to start the slideshow from start here. Um, my presentation is based on a, a book that I wrote, Blackness in Western Europe, and uh, it's multidisciplinary in the sense that uh, um, I work together uh, in a team with uh, artists and historians and and art historians. I'm inspired by Bill and James Baldwin um, about the, the embeddedness of history and the, the presence of history everywhere and the need to face history. And the history of slavery has not really been faced and acknowledged a lot uh, by the Dutch, by the Netherlands. Um, uh, I'm convinced that mapping, spatial analysis uh, can help facing and changing. And uh, it can bring history closer and that is what I try to do with my projects. Uh, we look at history with the eyes of today. We are in society today, we are in life today, and today's issues lead us to new research questions. And that is very true for a lot of uh, developments I see around uh, slavery history and the history of the slave trade. Here are uh, some examples of uh, uh, questions that we are, are trying to address. We are trying to address uh, the history of slavery, but also the history of the black presence within Europe uh, uh, with the eyes of today. And we look back, um, who lived here before? What can we still see here today? And uh, we have inv and invented some new concepts around this. So the idea that there is something like slavery heritage is now gaining ground. Uh, it was never an, uh, a concept. And also the concept of slave ownership as something that has relevant locations within Europe is new. And that was introduced by Catherine Hall of University College London. So these are conceptual interventions and they are opposing earlier frames like uh, the, the golden age ID, um, which was a frame of, uh, of pride only. And now we see pride and shame. So we see different signs of this of the same coin. And we are in the middle of rewriting and reconceptualizing this complex history. And that, of course, also includes the history of racism. And um, looking back from uh, issues of race today, we look at the, the earlier meetings and the first meetings between black and white people and how that developed. And that leads us to uh, early modern history and at the same time at very politically sensitive discussions today. In Amsterdam and in Rotterdam we are now expecting that the city council will come with excuses, formal excuses, to recognize the history of the city's involvement uh, in slave trading and in, in involvement in slavery. So 2020 has been a crucial year in bringing that to the fore uh, large demonstrations, not only in Amsterdam, but uh, around the Netherlands, also in small towns and across Europe. Um, a new book is out, uh, Slavery in East and West, uh, 
So we very much uh, combine not only the West Indies and the Americas history of slavery, but also the Asian uh, history. So the Dutch East Indies and the Dutch West Indies are now both studied and comparatively, and also abolition of slavery, abolition of the slave trade is, is studied at the same time together. One of the big breakthroughs is that national institutions, archives and museums are now dedicating larger exhibitions on slavery. So the Rijks Museum slavery exhibit is opened. The museum is uh, still closed for the lockdown, but as soon as that is over, and we hope next month, we will be able to see that uh, new and very new exhibition. Okay, mapping slavery. Uh, my project, uh, I, I want to convince you that anything can be mapped. All the presentations I've had, uh, I've heard so far, contain so many types of material that you can actually map, you can put them on a map. And uh, this is very engaging for students as well. Biographical research can become a map. Uh, so a picture can become a map. Uh, a set of uh, paintings can become a map. It can be, become a trajectory in time and a, a visual history also. We don't know who Albrecht Dürer's uh, portrait of an African man, who that was. What we do know already uh, where Katharina, uh, 20 years old, lived. She lived in Antwerpen, and we know now also the name of the family, a Portuguese family where she lived and where he um, drew her, uh, her portrait. So we can begin to write her history in more detail. We have a broad approach in our uh, in, in this project uh, because we we asked the question what is included in the history of enslavement so it's a very long age uh, centuries long uh, history a very deep history and it includes uh, centuries but also very actual uh, issues uh, today um, silences and uh, uh, and gaps that we can address so we uh, start in a way um, this history from looking from the moment of abolition the moment of emancipation uh, is a very interesting moment because that is the moment when slave owners are coming forward because they are lobbying for compensation uh, the slave owners receive compensation and they are successful in their in their lobby and that has created very crucial sources that we can work with as uh, historians so this is a database where you can fill in names of family members, and then you can find uh, how much financial compensation was paid out uh, to a slave owner uh, who had certain plantations or who had shares in plantation. And also the names of the enslaved can be found. So this database has been uh, built from the original source material of the compensation records in 1863 in the case of the Netherlands. And that has is now enabling a lot of historical research, but also public history projects. So I made with my students a map of the compensated slave owners, and we found out where they lived in Amsterdam. And that's brought history literally to the map of, uh, of Amsterdam in a very uh, short project, really. It was directly inspired by University College London by their project, Legacies of British Slave Ownership. So we saw that Europe remained absent uh, for a long time in slavery studies. And so we have to put Europe back on the map in a way. Um, these are some uh, things we've done in the last eight, nine years. I'll show you some routes and tours. This is a cycling tour and a walking book and tour about Amsterdam. And uh, my colleague, uh, Jennifer Tosh of Black Heritage uh, Tours has uh, initiated tours in in Amsterdam and also in New York. Oh, I'm a bit stuck, I think. Let me see what happens there. Um, can I still go? Yeah. So the New York uh, Histories is the second book we made, more than 90 locations. We found burial grounds and churches, very important. And I would love to continue that project in other parts of the US. Uh, Brooklyn was already very important. We think New Jersey, Delaware, the, uh, Virginia. Um, so if there are among you people who would like to do something like this together, I'd be very interested. So we start with simple Google Maps. Sim this is still Google. Now we work with uh, 
uh, archivists, uh, uh, and uh, so you, you bring different histories onto a map and it can work as education. Every, every dot on the map is a starting point for more research. Um, back in the Netherlands, in Europe, we are doing more research on uh, black, black biographical research because in the Netherlands, the idea is there were never any black people, which is of course not true. So here, uh, the, the 17th century uh, black networks of men, women, and children who lived here in Amsterdam, who were buried, who, who were able to marry together, um, who went to church. Uh, those records are quite important to sort of rehumanize and humanize these histories. So that is another part of our uh, project. A third project is uh, the, addressing the history of white supremacy, which is very much part of the history of the university. So uh, now Irving Painter's history of uh, uh, the invention of white people and the term Caucasian has a very European angle to it and also fetch very Dutch and Amsterdam contribution. So we look at the history of racial, racial science in the universities in Northwestern Europe. And that has not really been addressed yet. So we are only in the first starting points of that, both in Germany, in, in the UK, in France, uh, in Spain and Portugal and in the Netherlands and in Italy, we have these people who are celebrated as famous historians, as zoologists, um, collections of uh, uh, human remains, and it's all seen as history of science, and, and that has to be decolonized. So this uh, is an, an area where we are only just starting. So it's a long road from racial science to anti-racism. And in New York, there was already an early group active in this, but in Europe that became much later after the Second World War, and it's also a stagnated history. So there's a lot that we still have to do there. Sorry, Neil Hurston was one of the research assistants of Herskowitz in the 1920s. I want to summarize the, some patterns of paternalism, because I think paternalism is a very deep strand of European racism and of Dutch racism, and it is a, a sort of, it's called the velvet glove, very hard to address. It is pre uh, presented as, um, as well-meaning and as uh, well-intended and hard to oppose. Um, a, an important uh, element is also romantic racialism and exoticism. So as long as, um, Africans and Asians are far away from Europe, they, there can be this exoticized uh, portrait culture and um, a sort of uh, uh, favorite and exceptional idea about black people. And that uh, we can recognize that in many collections, in museums and archives. There is of course also uh, a hateful and violent form of racism, but that is much more uh, kept inside the record books and kept overseas and in the punishment records. Uh, we have to talk about race and religion, about race and, and the law, and all these uh, issues we're trying to address. So these are really fields of, of research that we are beginning to, to address more. So also as historians, we have to address historiography. Uh, because all the time histories have been written, courses have been taught, and theses have been defended. But I think we have to re look at that again. And what were the research questions? What was what remained absent? Uh, what was talked about? So uh, it's not that there was never anything written about the West India Company or the East India Company. We, we have to look again at what was written and what was kept out. So we're in 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 and rather than attacking other historians or earlier historians, I feel that showing uh, something else, showing the inevitable and overwhelming heritage of slavery and all the locations relevant to the slave trade uh, in uh, European uh, cities can have a sort of convincing effect that, oh yes, this is part of our history. We have to deal with this. We have to recognize this. We have to somehow acknowledge that this is part of a family history, the history of a house, uh, the history of a street, the history of an area. And that's now uh, beginning to happen. So it's an uh, inviting approach. Here are some pictures of the books we have produced, the Amsterdam Guide, the Dutch New York Guide, um, 
and here are some pictures from relevant locations and uh, some of them are already mentioned by Andrea, like Lot House is also in my presentation. Uh, here's uh, uh, Gerrit Smit in the middle, uh, a Dutch uh, friend of uh, uh, Douglas, uh, who's very active against uh, slavery. And this is the latest book we made uh, about uh, the Netherlands, uh, all over the Netherlands, um, with 100 locations. And uh, if you're interested, uh, I will tell you much more about it, but I know that we are pressed for time. So just some pictures of some of the maps. These are the 100 locations. These are some of the country houses uh, with colonial and slavery links. And all those, uh, that's heritage. They are still there, these country houses. So you can uh, uh, visit them and you can, uh, th they are now beginning to address slavery heritage as well. And these are some of the places where compensated slave owners were living in 1863. So after uh, Amsterdam, we have continued that work and it shows you that slavery was not only in the coastal areas, in the port towns, but uh, everywhere that there are these things that you can connect to it. So these are the maps I wanted to show. Um, we find things everywhere in areas that were, were never ever associated with the history of slave trade of the, or the slavery, um, inspired by the London project and I'm working now with ArcGIS, with Esri and with StoryMap and I would recommend all of you that that is very good software, easy to get, most universities have it and my students are working with it and uh, they really enjoy uh, working with that software. And this is my last slide with some links to the research project. Uh, the new research pro project is on hiding places, as you mentioned already in, in the introduction. So that is similarly to the slavery project, an idea of uh, diving into uh, secret histories and finding, uh, bringing information together. So thank you. Excellent. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for, your, for your presentation. It's quite wonderful. Um, if you have uh, question, uh, questions and, and points for discussion, please uh, submit those to the Q&A. Um, but as they come in, I think I'll use my, my right as the, the chair and moderator of this session to, to ask the first uh, question. Um, we, we bring together this great, uh, you know, international interdisciplinary group of scholars here today to have this conversation. And so I think the, the, the logical starting point for that, for this conversation is how might we be able to create clear conversations across uh, disciplines, across fields, and how, and, and even across different regions and, and countries. Uh, you know, Dr. Honius has uh, you know, transnational research in both uh, the Netherlands and New York. Uh, Dr. Holmes talked quite a bit about, you know, reaching out to all these scholars was such a central part of her education. So what are some ideas for, for creating and engaging in these cross-disciplinary, cross-field, international conversations? Go ahead, Andrea. <laughs> so I don't have a necessarily a solution, but that, that is one of the reasons why I was so excited about this, this panel and putting this together and having this conversation. Because when I first really started to look at spatial analysis in my work, I kind of struggled to find out how to piece that all together. There was work in archeology, span there was work in architecture, but to really figure out as a historian who's, who's really coming more from, from a traditional approach of studying history, it was, it was very hard to, to figure out where to go. Um, and, and so what I would love to see is to have more of these conversations out there or publications that really bring together people from different fields. But, um, but, but so that is my, um, you know, that those are some of my thoughts on that. I don't necessarily have any solutions. I don't know if anybody has some thoughts or maybe ways of, of, of thinking about this or able to, to cross it more easily, especially for those of you who may have done that more so in their work. Well, the, the fact that we are now here together on Zoom shows mm -hmm. that it has become in a way much easier to come together and to exchange information and to share maps and screens. Uh, it, uh, you always needed mm -hmm. money to, to buy a ticket and, and then a hotel and uh, you know location for a meeting and a lot of money. And so it is, in a way, it's easier now. So we, maybe we can do more. 
I think it really needs to be incredibly intentional to, to bring these bring people into different conversations. Um, I know, Andrea, we, you and I have talked about kind of the difficulty of finding resources. For me, I, I was in Kraki and I, I don't think that if I had come to my project as a graduate student that I would have, you know, been able to finish as quickly because I was fortunate to have a lot of training before I, I ever went to graduate school in archaeology and architectural history and to understand that those things were available. And I think a, a key part of that is um, public history and public history sites like Colonial Williamsburg that bring together collections of experts in a particular uh, particular chronological era or place and who have many different approaches. I think we need more spaces like that. I think it would be Incredibly, I, I know since I've been at Mizzou, I've had people telling me, you know, have you talked to the architectural studies people? Have you talked to uh, to folks on the other side of campus? And there just aren't those spaces in, in real life to, to have those conversations. And I, I think there's a lot of value in maybe trying to create those spaces and expose graduate students to them or as early on, as early as possible so that they understand that they, you know, they actually have to engage with the discipline. I, I have to agree that um, for those of us who are in a, a position to be training the next um, generation of graduate students, I think it would be really important when we have folks who are doing slavery studies to incorporate scholars into those dissertation projects from other fields. You know, I know, um, like Dr. Holmes, I had the great advantages of being in Williamsburg and taking classes with Dr. Wittenberg back in the day. Uh, and on my dissertation, I had uh, geographers as well as uh, anthropologists uh, on the committee who brought you know, a wide variety of perspectives to my work, or did they got me thinking in certain ways that I, I might not have otherwise been doing. So even though we might not necessarily have many places like Colonial Williamsburg around with the you know, university right there where we can use it as a field station to train students in multidisciplinary methodologies, I think we can do so in our own universities. Um, because as we've seen, you know, slavery was everywhere. Uh, for those of us who um, are intentional about it, we could practically create an interdisciplinary, you know, slavery studies program just about anywhere and have field stations available, you know, field sites available that we could explore. Excellent. Um, yeah, so our first question uh, from the audience comes from Ayla Levy at the University of Scranton, and it's for uh, Dr. Garcia, although I think we could open it up to, to everyone on the panel. Um, it's this question specifically for them, but the, but the bigger question I think can, everybody can answer. Um, and the question is, what does it mean, practically speaking, to remap a city from the perspective of enslaved people? Uh, have you gone about remapping Havana, or what would you hope to do? What lessons have you learned from remapping a city in this way? So thank you for that. And I, I can go ahead and, and start that answer. Um, it's actually one of the projects that I'm working on now. That's the digital component of, of the work. Um, what that means specifically is redrawing, quite literally, figuratively, redrawing the colonial map. So the map that we see of Havana um, this day, and I'll, I'll find a, I'll put a link to the in, in the chat, is one that privileges the port, the bay, and the Atlantic, right? And the interchanges and relationships that that were procured as a result of as a result of that, and that's really important for obvious reasons, right? The colonial administration was concerned with the Atlantic because of the empire. They were concerned with mobility in and around the Caribbean and, and the Circum Caribbean, um, but that's not necessarily the geography that enslaved people were concerned with or negotiating. So what it means is shifting our gaze and our focus with the image that we that we have away from that. So looking at a geography that isn't necessarily circumscribed by the walled city, the physical walls, or by the port, the bay, and the Atlantic, right? And for me, I didn't really begin to understand the city outside of its colonial production until I got, until I spent years in Havana talking to the archaeologists, actually. So again, I'm going to echo what everybody is saying. As, as a historian, I was trained to look at the documents, right? When I got to Havana and spent years with those colleagues, they were interested in figuring out the materiality of the city. And it's not until I got into those positions that I thought there's something that we're missing, right? Just by not focusing on the fact that the forts actually obscure, obscure any kind of picture to the Atlantic for most of the people that were laboring within them, right? Um, 
there was another question in the in the chat that I'm going to go ahead and take the privilege mm -hmm. of answering on the marshes. The marshes, for example, were a huge focal point of the colonial administration, in part because they implicated the city in a kind of um, in a kind of way that wasn't productive for tourists, for example, and for travelers. And so it implicated the the governance, the governance of the colonial administration. So they were focused on on the marshes as a way of thinking about how to do away with those spaces and slave spaces mm. that were so important for fugitivity. They also become really important um, in the transition from colonial rule to the US occupation because it's what the US occupation and the government focuses on um, to, to celebrate the kinds of public works that are being introduced to Havana, right? So it's the same focus of both the colonial Spanish administration and the neo-colonial US occupation for very similar reasons, right? They're, they're concerned with policing, they're concerned with elevating the role of the government. And what we end up seeing is that in fact, the US occupation, what that government does is it reproduces the same map. It quite literally uses the same map that was produced under Spanish colonial rule and just overlays that map with the introduction of new roads or new public works um, projects and the er eradication of those swamps and marshes, right? It's the, it's the same image. And so what that tells us, I think, is that if we look beyond that, right? I, I think it's significant that two different administrations in, in competition with one, with one another managed to come up with the same image of Havana. If we look at an image of the city that is that is outside of that, what we see is not the Bay, not the Atlantic, not um, the Caribbean, but actually inland, the material and built and natural environment that slaves had to negotiate, enslaved and uh, free people of color had to negotiate to both become more visible in, at certain moments and less visible during others. And so I think that this involves, as others said, a, a GIS project, a digital humanities project, where we can speak against the images that have already been produced by producing new ones that take into account the narratives that we have that are not the colonial maps that were produced by the colonial, by the administrations. Anybody else want to weigh in on remapping from the perspective of the enslaved and what, what that might look like? If I could touch upon that um, on a plantation context again, um, in here, I've had I have the great privilege to work on a site where there's a massive um, archival record, um, both correspondence. It was, a, it was owned by an absentee planter in, in England, um, and he had quarterly correspondence back to his agents in Jamaica. Um, they kept, he had a, a grandson who wound up being a great uh, book collector, so organized all the family papers back in the 1870s, so everything was kept in, in really great order. Uh, kind of a dream for someone who wants to go in and look at an archive. And um, reading the correspondence, you often see, and again, you have to take this in context, these are, you know, plantation agents writing back, but from their perspective, um, oftentimes the, um, the plantation is the, the best spaces that from their perspective, the most productive spaces on the plantation are being occupied by the enslaved uh, for their provision grounds. Again, in Jamaica, people needed to grow their own food. They, they survived on, on food that they produced outside of the uh, labor regime for slavery. And so, um, you know, good farmers would find the best land to grow their crops um, for their own use and for sale in local markets. So um, interestingly enough, uh, when you start peeling that away, you can start to see that the plantation really was a space outside of the, the small areas where you have commodity production. The, the vast 5,000 acres was perceived very differently um, from the point of view of the enslaved. What uh, the planters would call ruinate, right? Land that was not good for producing crops uh, might, very, might be very you know, well suited to growing root vegetables um, that uh, people could survive on, they could feed their children with, they could sell again in the market for, for cash. So um, I think trying to understand the plantation from that perspective gives us a much better understanding of how, you know, how, how complex the spatial and, and social dynamics were. Excellent. Um, our next kind of question, I get, it actually segues pretty well. We talked about exterior spaces and remapping exterior spaces, but the, the next question, it's, it's for uh, Dr. Mosterman, but I, but I think we can once again ask, every, ask it of the entire panel about um, how uh, female domestics reconceptualize space within slaveholding households as spaces of resistance, especially in, in regards to, say, poisoning or other acts of, uh, of resistance against slavery. Um, and that comes from Aaron Shearer from the University of Reading, or Reading. Yeah. 
I mean, that's such a great question, right? Um, one of the things that that I think spatial analysis shows is how, um, especially for enslaved people who work with in homes close to their enslavers, we see that they are very intentional in how they navigate those spaces and they have to be um, to avoid uh, certain confrontations, sexual abuse um, uh, among them. And, and I think that that is a very important part even of the resistance in some ways in, in knowing when to, to be where and how, mm -hmm. um, how to move through those spaces uh, and, and remain, remain safe or, or have uh, people closely remain safe. It also reminds me, uh, just thinking about this, about uh, Beth and Dion, who are, uh, in fact, enslaved women in Albany, New York, who are uh, accused of uh, setting the city on fire, starting at the Hansevoort's house. It's in the 1790s. And um, a large number of houses in Albany uh, burned down. And one of the things you can see in the testimonies is that they're meeting in the kitchen of one of their enslavers. And they know that that is the kitchen where they can actually meet. Uh, so there's a, an understanding of how they can navigate those spaces. And then they're they're walking down the streets of Albany with these hot coals, actually knowing when to avoid the watchmen of the city, um, timing their their movements through the city very carefully. And, and so they're not caught. It's not afterwards until they're actually caught. But in the moment, they know how how to avoid being being seen and being caught. So I think that there is a real understanding on the part of enslaved people, how they can uh, escape the surveillance uh, of their enslavers and, and how they can navigate those spaces in such a way to do so. If I and can, I'm, I'm sure, you know, in, in other circumstances, yeah, Aaron, please. I was gonna say, if I can follow up on what I was talking about, um, one of the things that I found really fascinating in my own work, whether it was in Virginia, South Carolina, or in Barbados, is that we typically conceptualize of domestic spaces. And I, I think Andrea's point about how we our, our misunderstanding of what is a of, of what a domestic space is in the colonial period um, is really important here. That within domestic spaces, you actually see a fair amount of gender parity. We tend to think of them as um, female spaces, whether you're talking about white enslavers or enslaved people. But when you actually crunch the numbers, these households are fairly equal in terms of the number of female and male enslaved uh, domestic laborers. And so when you think about the, the way that shapes dynamics within the house and, and kind of the, the inversion of traditional expectations about social hierarchies where a plantation mistress for instance is going to be the head of that hierarchy that includes a large number of men is, is really, I think, important to think about. And the way that just the movement through spaces um, these spaces are so often built by enslavers, but learning uh, more effective ways to navigate them just at a very simple uh, level of, you know, how do you point A to point B, I think forms its own kind of resistance in thinking about how we reclaim uh, our time um, and how enslaved people reclaim their time for themselves and, and to make it so that they are not just at the, the whim of the enslaver or kind of dictated to by by the needs of their work. I think of Mount Vernon a lot when I when I think about labor and kind of the inconvenience of the household because in redesigning the house in the 1750s, Washington um, decides, or not in the, the 50s, in the, the 70s, he decides that he really wants a wing that's gonna be cut off from the rest of the house because he's anticipating visitation. So many people coming through his house. And so for enslaved people, you can't go straight from the second floor on one side of the house to the second floor on the other side of the house. You either have to go back downstairs and come up to the Washington's bedroom or go up another floor and come down to the Washington's bedroom. Um, so thinking about how you need to be strategic in negotiating those spaces and avoiding certain people, as Andrea said, um, who you might know are potential threats is really important to think about. Yeah. And just to, just to add to that, you can also even see it within the architecture, like the, the, the stairs that enslaved people um, would have been using um, 
oftentimes when you go into these basements, they would have had these very narrow stairwells that in most cases, enslavers would not go down unless they really had to. And so they had these, these ways of, the, in the, the way that these homes were built, that also gave an opportunity to enslave people to kind of create some, some autonomy and some, some of those spaces whenever possible. So yeah, just wanted to add that. And just, you brought up stairs. I'm sorry, Andrea. I, I my grad thesis was on staircases. <laughs> so I have thoughts on staircases, um, but even thinking about kind of the physicality too, those back stairs are always built at a higher pitch. They're always built more narrowly. They're always built without le with less light, which on the one hand is incredibly constraining. It makes them incredibly uncomfortable. So as you said, enslavers don't use them unless absolutely necessary, but they also actually physically force you to move more quickly through those spaces, um, which you can see as kind of, um, a way if you're if you're occupying those spaces as a form of resistance if you're using those spaces to plan um an escape or to plan something else then you're being really conscious about taking the use of that space which is supposed to make you move faster and work harder and turning it into an advantage wow thank you wow fascinating and anybody else in the way on the interior spaces uh, before we Okay. Oh, Dr. Hodius, did you want to? Right. Um, yes. Shall I take? Uh, uh, I very much like the stories about staircases and yeah. and uh, smart forms of agency and of resistance. Really, yeah, the spatialized forms, and that uh, it ties in with my hiding places uh, project, but also very much with uh, the Underground Railroad and the, the tours and the trajectories and the pathways that you can, and you can really map that. So I, uh, and, and it can be a great part of a public project. I mm -hmm. see a few questions uh, uh, about um, the Dutch society and reactions and how has it, uh, has slavery shaped uh, uh, Dutch society? That's a very big question. Um, what I see is very, is very recent change and growing awareness or growing willingness to address uh, slavery history and uh, not really an, an acknowledgement on, on that slavery and the slave trade has shaped the whole economy or shaped the whole history. So it is our work of making uh, this part of history inevitable and tangible and close by that uh, has, has an effect that people say, okay, well, yes, um, maybe <laughs> so it's one step forward, one step backward, uh, but eventually I think that we are moving, that there is progress in, in that sense. And the plantation uh, histories, I, I think, uh, have also great potential. So, uh, James, your work on plantation, that you can make connections with the plantation owners and where they live. And uh, in, in Jamaica, that is, of course, nearby. But there, of course, lots of plantation owners also live in London. And, and with those connections or in the, the Suriname plantation owners live in Amsterdam. And you can make those connections and the people are doing that now. So they can find in the, in the databases names of uh, names of the enslaved and of slave owners. So people are descendants and let's say uh, of slave owners, of enslaved. And that becomes a kind of identity uh, there was a television series in the Netherlands uh, last year where people who found themselves in a database as descendants of one plantation came together and began to study the history of that plantation together. So that's an example that even though from the Netherlands, seen from the Netherlands, that is of course thousands of miles away, but you can still study that history today as if the ocean is not there. So there's another really great question I wanted to address. It just popped up in the Q&A about uh, movement between plantations. And this is kind of, this is interesting to me because uh, in modern day Jamaica, at least when I've been doing my field work, there are still two different transportation pathways, routes called roads and tracks, right? And the roads are, uh, they're building highways now, but for most of my time visiting Jamaica, they were virtually the same roads that were in existence in, in 1800, 1820. Uh, which were designed primarily for horses and mules. Uh, it was expected that even the lowest of the white uh, plantation workers would have a horse 
right, to, to move between places and they would follow the roads. The enslaved wa walked on tracks, they walked on paths that a horse could not easily walk through. There's little trails. Uh, and to this day, when I'm walking around plantations, uh, I'll sometimes veer off and the guys I'm working will say, you know, James, stay on the track. And I'm looking and I can't even see it, right? It's just like this little pathway of beaten down grass sometimes between plantations, um, which you can't see often from, from the roads. So there was an independent system of moving things around, of moving people around. And part of that was a concept, you know, in Caribbean studies, we sometimes call petite marunage, where um, people disappear from the plantations, but without the intention of staying away. So one of the projects I did up in the Blue Mountains was I, I had this long series of, of, of day books, uh, which, you know, recorded when people were, you know, what they were doing during the course of the day, the enslaved. And there was always a line for runaways. And I was able to, and when they left and when they came back. So I was able to sort of track the amount of time people were gone from the plantation. And typically it was between two weeks and 17 days. And um, then people would return. They would leave for two weeks and then come back. Um, likely they were going to visit um, their uh, relatives or perhaps going into uh, the bush to work on a, uh, on a, on a harvest for in, in their own fields. But it was time and space and travel pathways that were separate from the from the plantation world. And you know, one of the most dramatic of these, I remember, was a woman who was nine, eight, eight and a half months pregnant, eight months pregnant. She was described as, who disappeared from the estate, uh, and then came back. Um, it was written in the the log. Came back two months later from Kingston, without her child. So apparently, this woman had walked from the top of the Blue Mountains down into the city. Who knew, I don't know who she visited there, but apparently it could have been her mother, could have been a sister, could have been, I don't know, could have been the father of the child, um, had her baby and then came back without it um, after just a couple of months. So I think this was a very common kind of activity, uh, at least in the, in the rural context that I've seen in Jamaica, that you did have these, these, these um, liminal times and liminal spaces that people were occupying outside of the plantation world. Uh, in these spaces, these tracks, these you know pathways that they would connect their worlds to each other outside of the realm of the the, the main transportation networks, which were really designed to move commodities around. Does anybody else want to jump in on that? That's a fascinating question. Yeah, Andrew. No, just uh, to add that within within the context of New York. Um, and, and especially within the cities, it kind of relates to what I was saying earlier, but you see that people are, are uh, moving through alleyways, for example, that there's very much kind of the, this focus for the, the, um, uh, the white population to, to focus on the front of the houses, the, the, the streets, uh, the main streets, whereas in safe people were usually located at the back of the house. And so you can see in the records how they're, they're selling things in, in those back areas. They're um, jumping fences. They know how to navigate cities in, in those areas and via those alleyways in a way to avoid uh, being seen and, or being caught. So you see similar things in the urban areas um, to that. I, th I just wonder, I mean, it's, it strikes me, I, I keep thinking about the way in which uh, indigenous people in the Americas drew maps, which is very different than the way, we, of course, and, and so it's almost, do we have to come up with an entire different way of, uh, of, of uh, drawing space, I guess, to, to match the way in which enslaved people, uh, you know, because if you think about a traditional map, like what James showed, right, the, these tracks would look very different. They have a much more importance, right, to perhaps even drawn larger as indigenous people did. Um, so the entire way in which they can see the space is, is very different. Mm -hmm. I think that's a real, actually, Jared, that's an incredible point, because there's, um, there's a map in the collections of the American Philosophical Society from the, the Treaty of Easton that is just fascinating. It's, it's um, the map was originally drawn on the treaty table in chalk by one of the Lenape negotiators. And so the clerk for, um, for the, they had um, a, a I'm missing the word, sorry. Um, they had a uh, secretary for the Lenape who was Tate's. And so he actually transcribes, um, he draws the map out, but he makes a note to describe how the map is drawn by focusing on the features that the, the negotiator had started with and where they spread out from there. And then on the facing page, he copies um, a the same area from an, a printed English map 
of, um, of Pennsylvania. And when you compare the two, like there are obvious sim similarities, but thinking about kind of the construction of that map. So where do you start versus where do you end and how do you get there um, are just so, so critically different. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And how do you think I, that space is permanent or impermanent um, hmm. as well? Yeah, excellent. Um, it looks like uh, Dr. Hungus is answering the last question um, as she just did. Um, so I think uh, that is it. Um, and so thank you all for joining us uh, for our, our panel this mor uh, it's morning for me, it's afternoon for other folks, it's evening for others <laughs> on, on the panel here. Um, so, so, but thank you all for joining us. Um, this, I, I think it speaks to the, the, the potential we have, which, which uh, you know, we, we talked about a little bit ago for, for collaborating. Um, so thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to continuing these conversations in the future. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for pulling us together. It was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. I'd like to give one more thank you to our generous sponsors, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Stanton Foundation, the History Channel, and Oxford University Press. Uh, thank you all to everyone who submitted questions today. And finally, a special thanks to our panelists. Thanks for joining us. Bye. Yeah, bye-bye. Bye, y'all. Bye.